Hi guys, I'm Sabrina Halper and you are listening to Tomorrow Talk, a podcast by Hoff Capital. Okay, so today on the show, we are going to be diving into the field of prenatal genetic testing and gene editing and all of that innovation with the one and only Ozan Atai, who is the co-founder and CEO of Billion to One. Billion to One is a leading company in the field and they create prenatal diagnostic testing to help expecting mothers understand the risks of certain genetic defects in their babies. And we have a very special co-host today, Victor Wang, who is a partner at Hoff Capital and a bit of an expert in the biotech world. So we are going to dive into it. I am so excited to be doing this one together. So we can just get started. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, You both know a lot more about this space than I do. So I think to start it off, it would be great, Ozon, if you could kind of break it down for us and let us know, like on the most basic level, what are you developing at Billion to One? You know, what is the scope and significance and what was the status quo before your technology? Yeah. Thanks for having me, first of all. So, um, Molecular diagnostics is really changing. And one of the things that scientists have realized in the last decade that all of our tissues are shedding fragmented cell-free DNA into the bloodstream. So these are kind of little pieces of DNA that are coming from all of your tissues, all of your cells. And it is essentially a microcosm of your body uh, in a blood sample, right? If you can take that blood sample, you can potentially see what is happening in a tumor for cancer testing in a, in a developing baby. You don't have to do these invasive methods of really trying to get a tissue sample directly from the, from that cancer or from that fetus. Those can be invasive, difficult. Uh, they can lead to miscarriages for, uh, pregnancy care. Um, so really, taking a blood sample and being able to analyze that very accurately to be able to determine, for instance, what therapy should be used for a particular tumor. Um, So what we have done at Billion to One is that we have developed quantitative ways of looking at cell-free DNA. And in particular, we have developed a way to count DNA molecules, which in turn improves the resolution of this diagnostics by more than a thousand fold. So previously people could only look at kind of really large scale changes, which means that they can't look at most of the genetic changes that are happening. They would miss mutations for cancer care. They would only be able to look at a handful of disorders that are at the chromosome level. So we improve that resolution by orders of magnitude so that we can even see a single base pair change. So if you think of your genome as a huge library, right, previous methods could only say that this whole section is missing, whereas most disorders are caused by kind of one letter change in one of the books in that library. So we have developed the only method to be able to find that one change. Wow, that's amazing. Um, So currently you guys have a unity test and that tests for over 10 different genetic defects that would be in fetuses. So you're mostly still focused on prenatal care, right? Correct. So we have used this technology to first develop Unity, which is uh, a test that determines these genetic disorders in the baby from maternal blood. And in particular, these are the most common genetic disorders in the world, but also there are so many actionable improvements that you can do if you know that your baby is going to have one of these disorders. That is why they are also particularly recommended by American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and that the current recommendation is that these should be screened in every pregnancy. The problem is that the current methodologies can't really screen them without relying on these invasive methods. And in particular, five of these disorders are caused by these single base pair changes. So we have the only technology that can look at those particular disorders like cystic fibrosis, like sickle cell disease, like spinal muscular atrophy. Wow. So basically being able to identify these genetic defects like really early on in the fetus can help parents basically 
raise their child like from the offset to like mitigate the effects. Do you ever see a world in which you could not only identify these genetic defects early on, but you could also fix them? Um, yeah, I mean, for instance, with SMA, which is the number one genetic cause of infant mortality, and it is an extremely progressive, terrible disorder, there are now three FDA-approved treatments, and one of them is essentially a gene therapy. Uh, so it's kind of as close to a cure as, as you might be able to get. And the, the way that um, these uh, therapies work is that you have to administer it as soon as the baby is born. In fact, we think that in, in, in the future, there might even be a time where you might want to administer it in the womb. But early that the earlier that you can administer this therapy, it stops the progression of the disorder. So you have a close to a normal life if you can start the treatment kind of as early as possible, which is usually as soon as the baby is born. What is your kind of dream vision for this technology and for Billion to One in you know, 10, 20, or even 100 years? So what we have developed uh, is a platform technology, right? It, it really solves the core problem in molecular diagnostics. Uh, it allows us to look at cell-free DNA and be able to fundamentally change how diagnostics is being done for really a multitude of areas and disorders. So in particular, we have now that we have proven that we have the single molecule sensitivity, that we can detect these single molecules of cell-free DNA with single kind of base pair changes, you can think of how that can completely transform oncology care because the yeah. technical problem is the same. Tumor is shedding that DNA. And today, a lot of our approaches are not personalizing cancer, right? You start the treatment and you the, the oncologists have to rely on scans. And scans are mm -hmm. so actually, I mean, they're they're kind of methods from 1980s, right? You, you are really trying to compare two different scans to see whether the tumor grew or shrunk. And the resist criteria, the criteria by which an oncologist determines whether you are responding to therapy or not, is a change in size of that tumor by 30%. Usually by that time, it's almost too late to change the therapies. So there is this growing understanding that you are not going to cure cancer by developing 10% better therapies. You are, but you might get as close to curing cancer as possible by 10 times better diagnostics, by being able to figure out what mutation is in the tumor so that you have the right targeted therapy, that you know when that patient is not responding to therapy within weeks of starting the treatment, as opposed to waiting months and months and it metastasizes during that time. Wow. That's, that's, that's so interesting. That could also be maybe a a way where it's like, instead of getting scans, people just get their blood taken once a year to check for like breast cancer, for example. Definitely. So one of the areas in which that we will eventually grow into, and this can take multiple years and an area where I think there is a lot of excitement is that can we develop a single blood test that not only looks at one cancer type, but looks at multitude of cancers and be able to detect it early so that it can be removed before it kind of grows and becomes a really big problem. And it is almost definitely going to happen in the next decade. Wow. And it's going to really change how we are catching these cancers. There is something where it's like regulation would stop some of this from becoming mainstream right now. But where we're at today, just from our technical capability, like what can we do in terms of CRISPR? Like can someone look at a fetus and pick and choose what they would want their child to look like and be like? Are we there yet? Uh, we are not there yet. Um, okay. So the, I think it is important to understand the kind of difference between kind of what can we detect and what can we change. Um, so mm -hmm. in terms of diagnostics and cell-free DNA uh, diagnostics, the, we are getting close to a point where we can really be able to see what we want to see, right? Whether it is prenatal or cancer and, and developments are kind of really incredible. And it has become um, this really big force in molecular diagnostics. Um, and CRISPR is 
extremely, I think, promising when it comes to two areas. One of them is research. It really streamlines the research. If you want to change a particular gene and a model organism and see how that is going to impact the function of that gene, that protein, CRISPR has become an incredible tool in in facilitating the discovery process and our understanding of biology and the cell. Um, And it is, I think, also going to become an important area for therapeutics, right? There are certain um, therapeutics areas where CRISPR can really make a big impact. But it is one thing to kind of change, for instance, a single cell and be able to edit that using CRISPR versus a, a a developing baby that has kind of millions and billions of cells. And that can become mm-hmm. kind of much more challenging to, to edit uh, using CRISPR. That is why certain disorders are much more amenable to CRISPR. Like if you are talking about sickle cell disease, like blood-based disorders, because you don't need to fix every single cell. Right? Even if you have particular small number of progenitor cells that you that are fixed that can significantly improve the, the outcome and the, the symptoms of that person. So in those areas, I can see CRISPR actually really making a huge impact in the therapeutics of particular disorders. But it is not going to be something where Kind of as the baby is developing, we are going to kind of see all these things and be able to change what we are looking for. And even at a single embryo stage, right, it is not even single kind of cell stage if we are just kind of forcing everyone to undergo IVF, which I, I don't think is going to happen. But if even in that particular kind of futuristic setting where everyone decides to do IVF and they want to select particular genes, the number of kind of embryos that you are going to have, like number of single cell eggs that you are going to have is going to be very limited. So unless there are other developments where we can convert, I don't know, a, a number of skin cells to that particular embryo state so that you have millions of cells that you can work with, then you start getting into a point where maybe you can uh, start changing things. But even at that point, instead of changing things, I think the better approach would probably be selecting things. And if you have thousands and thousands of potential eggs that you can select from because you converted skin cells to them, the better approach is not to try to change something that can have a unintended effect somewhere else in the genome yeah, yeah. better thing is probably like choose the the traits that that the 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 parents already have and kind of have the best combination uh, that i believe kind of is a little bit like gataka but i and i think we are still quite a bit far away from that point also yeah, because yeah. not everything is genetic and when, even when things are genetic our understanding of those genetic factors is still quite limited it's just been so um, impressive to see how far you know you've been able to come in just a few years. Uh, I guess one question then that we had for you was, uh, you know, how then have you defined and measured the success of billing to one thus far? Um, so, you know, what are like the core KPIs that you focused on? What's your north star? Um, you know, that'd be super interesting to dive into. Yeah, um, thank you. That's really a great question. We are just scratching the surface. Um, There are so many more problems that we can solve. There are so many more people that we can help. Uh, We can really an incredible legacy and build a category defining company and change, not really just change, transform molecular diagnostics in a way that has never been done before. Um, And um, really the the two North Stars that we have had um, for our five-year goals was, and this was back in 2020, was to making our our unity complete, the, the gold standard of standard of care as, as was the objective. And the way that we measured that was five key results. And those key results were things like being able to help 1 million patients make confident decisions, right? And it's kind of really interesting because at that time we were getting 
one test per week. And so looking at five years out and saying that we are going to get to one million patients is a very bold statement. But now that we have uh, kind of grown 300, 400% year over year consistently, we actually have line of sight to that one million patients. And that, that was kind of one of our North Stars. And the other one was oncology. We always thought of this as prenatal and oncology, and that was transforming cancer treatment monitoring. Because the treatment monitoring, if we do a much better job, that is going to change not only oncology care, it's going to help millions of patients, but it is also going to eventually even change how drug development is happening. Because if we don't have to wait four years to determine whether a, a particular t- treatment is successful, that can significantly accelerate the time to approval for these drugs. It's not going to happen overnight, right? We are talking about a very entrenched industry and regulators. But as we prove that this is the better way of doing things, it's not going to be helpful just to us and just to the patients, but it is going to change all of oncology care, including therapeutics. I, I love that answer. Um, you know, so much of what you've talked about is about the impact here. And, you know, maybe just to drill down one level deeper, you know, if you were to quantify what could be the impact of liquid biopsy on oncology care um, in terms of, you know, eventually total number of, you know, patients whose lives are, you know, saved or improved, um, or even like the, um, you know, economic um, burden that you guys reduce, you know, to the healthcare system. Uh, like, how, how would you kind of quantify it uh, in the long term? So, I mean, in both prenatal and oncology, uh, what we are trying to do is not only to improve healthcare outcomes, but also do it in a way that saves healthcare costs, because that is the way to do something that is at scale. And every single, single gene NIPT single gene non-invasive prenatal test that we perform saves healthcare system more than $7,000 in healthcare costs. So if you think about kind of hundreds of thousands that we plan to do on the oncology side, the impact is, is potentially even larger, right? We are talking about a hundred billion dollar market. We are talking about a, a really problem that will impact one in two to one in three people, right? So this is a little bit pessimistic, but we are three people here. So <laughs> one of us <laughs> um, in our lifetime, like we will have to deal with cancer statistically speaking, right? That is the average that we are going to, it's one in two to one in three. Yeah. So it's really everyone. It's not just one person, right? It is, it is going to potentially impact everyone. And by being able to have solutions that can dramatically improve the oncology care and dramatically improve the potential for new drugs, that can really change kind of how it can help all of us. Um, something I've heard you talk about is that most diagnostic companies actually end up failing because they don't get reimbursed by insurance companies for like years and years. So how did you think about this when you were when you were building it out? Yeah, so I mean reimbursement is is such a big problem in healthcare system, especially in the United States. Um, it doesn't really support innovation, right? For you to get a category one CPT code that then you can use to build insurance companies, not only you have to show that your test is effective, that it is saving healthcare costs, that it is improving outcomes, right? It is not that you are just detecting them, but it is actually resulting in better outcomes. You do all of those studies that would cost millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. And then even then that is not sufficient to get a category one CPT code. Then you need to essentially get almost nationwide usage. Like the, the one of the one of the criterion is that the, the people across the country, the, the doctors across the country are using the test 
which is a little bit of catch-22 because the doctors don't want to use a test that is not reimbursed. So it really creates a lot of problems. That doesn't mean that it is impossible to overcome that. There are diagnostic companies that do overcome that, but it does require kind of years and years and years of investment. And a lot of the times there is that valley that you have to cross and it is very difficult to do so. So in our case, once we had this kind of really remarkable technology, we wanted to prove that technology in an area where that would be easier. It is still a challenge because even in cases where you are supposed to get reimbursement, insurance companies are not incentivized to really pay for services, even if a test is medically necessary. And even if there is a guideline, they are still going to do things that are going to make it difficult for you to get paid, but at least it gives you a fighting chance. And in this particular area, what we have done is that we have purposefully gone into a testing methodology where we, there were already guidelines, there were already reimbursement infrastructure in. It's just that we had a vastly better test that allowed us to kind of piggyback on what existed to get paid. And while doing that, kind of really prove the power of the technology so that we can go into other areas like oncology and become a larger company while you are doing that. I think it's really an incredible um, area that allows a lot of innovation to happen. The main caveat being that a lot of the time those innovative tests don't get reimbursement uh, for many years after that. But so it's a bit more on the the issue is a little bit more on the side of like insurance companies and healthcare. Yes, than exactly. The FDA. Okay, good to know. Two percent of US GDP. I'm not talking about healthcare spending. Two percent of US GDP is spent on pushing paper back and forth between the healthcare providers and the insurance companies that are trying not to pay. Do you see an opportunity basically to modernize that industry, even on like the paper side of it? Or is it just, it's just something that's just going to take a long time. It's just one of those kind of like age old industries. I think there is, I think there is tremendous opportunity, but it is a, it is not an easy area. Right. I think there was this uh, group, uh, I think it was Amazon, JP Morgan, Berkshire. They want, they kind of solve the same inefficiency and they said that we want to solve this insurance problem. And then 18 months later, they said we were too naive. <laughs> this is like too big of a problem even for us. Uh, so that kind of tells you the, the scope and the difficulty of the problem. But it is also an area where I think there is tremendous opportunity for disruption. It is a $500 billion spending every year on kind of various areas of reimbursement. And there are companies that are trying to modernize different parts of this, but it is going to be difficult. It is going to take many, many tries, and it's going to be a minefield of problems for these startups. But again, but again the, the, the opportunity is, is huge. Um, yeah. the, going back to um, your question um, around kind of LDTs, uh, lab developed tests and innovation, um, the, we have seen, I think, the impact of this uh, FDA oversight when COVID-19 first happened. Um, there is a, uh, I think, really a good article written by um, by uh, academics at Yale University, I believe, where they kind of outline the missteps that happened during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because essentially what happened was U.S. had this really great a system of innovation where these clinical labs could really uh, develop COVID-19 tests and bring them to the market relatively quickly. But because there was FDA oversight, it really delayed the production and the scaling of the tests at least for two, three months in the most important period of the pandemic where we could control it a little bit more. And the interesting thing was that um, even though there was that FDA oversight, I think it is 
questionable to say that the quality of the tests that were um, eventually approved, I don't think they they were on, on average were higher than what would have happened uh, without that with with just on the clear LDT side. So it's yeah. it's a little bit of I think a power struggle as well between HHS the, uh, and yeah. FDA, and we'll see kind of what happens uh, through the valid act. Um, I think there is a very small probability that it gets passed. Um, but it is an interesting area that we are watching very closely as well, that there is already a reimbursement problem. I think it would be unfortunate that uh, the companies would have to go through kind of multiple layers of FDA approval for LDT. I know there's a lot we want to ask you about, like, your personal founder journey and also how you made the switch from like being in academia to being a founder, that learning curve. Yeah. Um, you know, you've had just a tremendous journey and we've been, you know, fortunate to kind of learn, uh, you know, a little more of the backstory, um, you know, behind your journey, Ozan. How did you make that transition from an academic um, to a founder? Um, what were some of the um, kind of learning moments early on? How did you eventually like kind of make that successful transition? Um, I think the transition for me um, was relatively smooth, mainly because I have always been interested in learning more. Um, I have kind of, I have as much background in physics as, as molecular biology, but I also minored in like computer science, applied mathematics, like different disciplines regardless of what area of business that we are talking about, I would kind of dedicate myself to learning it. This is true for reimbursement and market access, right? Two areas that are really critical for diagnostics. And I have really great executives who are leading those functions. Even if I were kind of a business executive, Right, I wouldn't know many of those different areas. Whereas having that equal, I think, interest in all the different areas and making sure that we are doing not only a good job but a great job in every single aspect of our business is very important to me. So one of our kind of ideas or rules is that every single department needs to be a competitive advantage on its own that we need to not only match kind of the industry or the competitors, that we need to be better than every single one of them. And that is really only possible if you have this really kind of big appetite for learning everything there is to learn about every single one of those areas. Wow. I like so much of your answer. Um... And, you know, just because we're running out of time here, um, maybe the last question on my side was, you know, beyond what you just touched about, uh, touched on in that answer, you know, um, being willing to learn, um, seems like hiring the right people, uh, you know, making sure everyone, uh, every single department of your business has a competitive advantage, right? Um, is there any, any other keys to your personal and professional success or to the success of Billion to One that you haven't touched upon earlier in this conversation? Would just love to learn about that. I think being very conscious and deliberate about your culture from day one is very critical. Um, culture is not just the words that you write on a piece of paper. You have to live by them. You have to make the difficult decisions by them. You have to hire the right people based on the values that you have and that the company that you want to create. And that has so important and from very early days when we did not have really any employees we have decided what our company should stand for what our cultural values would be and that we have set a bar for hiring that was just extremely high and that sounds really good but it is actually extremely painful and being willing to take that pain and say that we are not going to lower our bar just because we really need someone for this function or for this department or for this role is a constant struggle that you have to keep 
having that not lowering that bar and saying that we are going to hire a superstar for every single position is something that really, I think, makes your company successful in the long term. But in the short term, it is extremely painful that you have to accept and you have to hire your executives with that has the same mindset because then they will also have the same mindset when they are hiring. And even to this day, we are almost 250 employees. I interview and before we hire every single person and I will continue to do that because I want to make sure that every single person who is coming here is coming for the right reasons and that they have the same bar and that we are hiring only superstars. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. It makes so much sense. I mean, you know, any one of those people can and will end up shaping the trajectory of the company. So it's like, it's not just about the founder or the executive team. It's, it's about, you know, everyone. And just to end off, um, I would like to know, uh, Oazan, what makes you optimistic and excited about the future? And like, when you think about, you know, what life might be like for your kids or grandkids, you know, what is, what's exciting? I think I'm optimistic um, of how innovation is accelerating in many ways. Um, I think compared to 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there is so much more innovation that is happening every day and it is happening more and more in biotech. Um, I think it is really incredible to see more investments that is that are going into healthcare, diagnostics, tools, and these different areas where it can truly change people's lives. And we are spending a little bit less money on 140 characters. We are still, I think, doing that, but at least a little bit more of it is going into healthcare. And there are really an incredible number of people who are choosing to do the right thing and to have a mission. But if we kind of, we can criticize the new generations in one way or another, but one thing that they have that is really incredible is that they are very mission oriented and that they can take a pay cut to work for a mission that is going to change people's lives. And that combined with the increasing and exponentially increasing investments in healthcare, I think is really going to result in a world that is much better for our children and their children. Thank you so much for being here today. It was an honor to have you. And it's really exciting to, you know, see and be on the sidelines and be able to, you know, be like a very, very small support at Hoff of, of what you're doing and what you're building and, you know, all the lives that you are ultimately improving. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Victor. It was my honor and pleasure. Uh, and I really enjoyed our talk as well. Thanks for inviting me.